All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us for our 47 sex talks in Sydney or 0x2f, that, if that makes sense to you, more sense to you. And uh, before I start, I would really like to thank our sponsors because with their help this year, we actually achieved quite a lot of things and managed to bring new things like things like we are trying to run a second event, a ninja night, a CTF night. And uh, you know, we had panel discussion. There are some discussion to invite some international speakers to come to Sex Talks. So really a round of applause for, for the, all the sponsors we have here. <laughs> and as you could see today, we do have live streaming happening. Uh, thanks to Dennis, the guy in the back from Streamgate, who is helping us, supporting us for that. So before I forget, some of you may have already saw that the second event, that the Ninja Night, the CTF Night, is going to happen next week. I don't know if it is now already fully booked, but it will be in a different venue at the Google Sydney office. So if you would like to do some practical hacking stuff, you want to RSVP there. The, um, one of the one of the other things I would like to mention here is uh, a lot of people ask for a lot of resources where they can find things. So these are the links. If you are looking for speaking at Sec Talks, there's a CFP form if you want to help with developing some CTF challenges. That's up there. And if you're looking for T-shirt, there's also things there. So that's all happy. Now. What I was going to say is that pretty much after this talk, we will head into this location. So feel free to, to join us. And we are going to do more networking at that event. Now, I, don't wanna, I just really want to keep my, my talks pretty short. Uh, one thing also, SANS is uh, running a community night. If you would like to know more about when it happens and where it is, I think Jay post the link on a Slack channel so you guys can there and check that out. And pretty much nothing. I would like to pretty much move to our presentation. But before I talk about it, let's look at an image <laughs> which we received from our, the speaker tonight. I mean, that may describe what this talk will be about. And it kind of surprised me. I will go through the description of the talk a bit later. But for that image, we had around 120 people RSVP and 109 on the wait list. I don't really know. Like, I'm just thinking like, with the other organizers that what may be hidden in that image that attracted that many people here. So I don't know, is this technography secret or a key to something? So you guys help, help us out. So the speaker we have tonight is going to take us through a journey of a discussion on a simple, cost-effective cybersecurity solution that you can implement into common office equipment to back up your friend's keystrokes to the cloud <laughs> and introduce pair programming effectiveness. <laughs> That's great. Uh, in the modern agile cyber cloud world. And, um, and all for less than the cost of a nice lunch. It depends on what the nice lunch will be. That's the question there. Now, the interesting part is he will go over design, implementation, gotchas, and where to get the parts, and some thoughts on existing, related, and future work in this space. That's very interesting. Now, the speaker for tonight's talk doesn't really need an introduction. I'm sure most of you, of you are familiar with him. He has been amazing to provide us with a lot of content, a lot of support, a lot of help by running workshops, by developing CTF challenges. And we keep inviting him here. And I don't know why, because he seems like, according to his own bio, he doesn't know computers. But we just keep having him here. So without further ado, please put your hand together for Norman, AKA Lean Underline S. Me. Okay. All right, moment of truth. 
Yes. All right. Okay. Um, hey, dudes. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. We've been talking about licking batteries. Um, let us start with <laughs> licking actual batteries, because this, this is a question which multiple people have asked me. Is it safe? Kinda. Kinda, and you can apply Ohm's law to determine how safe it is. Now, and the thing is that the funny thing about this is that a 9 volt battery isn't always at 9 volts, right? As you deplete it, it goes down. But this, the resistance of your skin and your tongue specifically is not always 1,000 ohms. Um, and this is highly, highly variable depending on like what area of your body you're sticking the 9 volt battery. Now, there's more. Um, uh, just, just plugging this in is kind of like a baseline. Gives us uh, 9 milliamps of current going through where the two terminals of the battery contact your skin. And how much does this hurt? Like, is it enough to kill you? Is it safe to lick a battery? So this isn't in the death zone yet. However, we are rapidly approaching the zone where muscular contractions will start so that you can't let go of the battery. Um, what I found really, really interesting about this is that as you go up, uh, there, there is actually a, a death zone. But the death zone has an upper ceiling, where above that, if you just pour more current into a person's heart, uh, they may not die. <laughs> you may get burns, and don't do this. I don't have first aid. Look, just don't do what I say, right? Never do what I say. All right. <clears throat> On with the show. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to talk about... Um, I guess simple stuff that you could do with hardware that was super cheap, super effective, and you can pick up all the parts like JCAR. Um, and the, the motivation for doing this is because a lot of the time, when you look at like our industry as a whole, when you look at like the security industry, when we think about physical pen tests, I think what we do is extremely limited in how we approach the problem, right? Like when I say, hey, you know, I'm going to start a physical pen test tomorrow, right? The first thing that comes to some of your minds, I bet, will be, okay, we're going to drop some USB sticks, which is, which is fine, right? But like, I think we collectively shouldn't limit our approach to this. Now, the stuff we're talking about today is not super technically complicated. Um, the idea is that you guys can all go home and do this, and I'll open source some code as well um, you know, to save you some time. Uh, but I, like, I hope all of you walk away with some new ways of thought. Uh, if not the like the exact technical approach to do this stuff. All right. First things first, keyboards, right? Because uh, when you're you know attacking a target, you're kind of thinking, okay, I need the uh, password, the credentials, the sensitive information. So I had a look. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Google. What have other people done in terms of hardware keyloggers, and how have they done it? And the most common thing that I found was something that looks like this. This is from Wikipedia, I think. And uh, the way that they do it, I think it's actually, it's pretty smart, right? So they, they kind of proxy the USB packet. So they go, they go to the computer, they go, hey, I'm a keyboard. And in, inside the little USB stick thingy is another computer, which acts as a USB host. And then so you plug your actual keyboard into there, and then you start typing away, and it's sending keystrokes to this computer, which is exfiltrating them, or you know, saving on my SD card, whatever. And then it sends its own messages, either original or modified, to the host, which is smart, right? But the thing is, uh, for those of you who work in like a, you know, your typical corporate-ish environment, I don't think you'd get away with it, right? Because you'd notice, like imagine if, if uh, you know, you, you came in and you, you know, left your laptop there for lunch, right? And then you, you went to lunch, you came back, and there was this weird <laughs> USB device. You'd be like, well, and... You know, the, like, there's no real excuse for it. You can't pretend it's something else. Like, it's quite clearly a keylogger. So, okay. So, it's like, okay, what can we do to solve this problem? Like, how can, we, uh, how can we solve this problem better? Let's look at the keyboard controller. So, I'll briefly go over. So, actually, who knows how these things work? Who's seen one of these before? Can I have a show of hands? Okay, so some people, all right. The way that keyboards work, um, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll just, I'll come back to this slide. The way that keyboards work is TLDR like this. Now, there's more electronics in your modern keyboard. This isn't all, but um, what you've got is you've got a set of 
pins, which you can see. You can see here. So these are the ones labeled like C are the columns and R on the right, the, the rows. So in this diagram, the two form a matrix. And when you hit a key, there's a connection between a column and a row. What the controller does, which is the, the blobby thing in the middle, right? It goes to all the columns or all the rows, doesn't matter. And it goes, I'm going to set one column to uh, like, send, send, like set it to logical high, which is apply voltage to that column. And then I'm going to read uh, which of the rows uh, have the same voltage. And through that, it can determine that you've hit a key or you've hit multiple keys. Uh, multiple keys gets a bit trickier, but probably outside the scope of this. Now, um, when I went about this problem, I was like, okay, so like, how, how am I going to attack this? I've got two broad options. One is I can proxy the USB connection myself. But inside a keyboard, you don't actually have that much space to move. Um, or I could just proxy the traffic going through the columns and the rows and sample it myself, which is what I did. It's really simple. And it does the exact same thing as a normal keyboard. Because I know how much time each row is set to high and how long it is until the next row is set to high, I don't actually have to measure them all. All I do is I measure one row, like I have a wait loop and I wait for the first row to be set high. And I go, okay, I know there's 12 rows, so I'm going to sample at, you know, 100 and something milliseconds or whatever, uh, each row to test that, yes, I'm synchronizing with the keyboard. And then once I've synchronized with the keyboard, I'm going to read in the state of all the columns. And then if the columns are not all zero, indicating that a key somewhere has been pressed, I'm going to transmit it. That's it. Um, you don't even have to decode this because each key, if you think about like the diagram there, if you hit any key, it's going to generate a unique pattern of row versus column, right? So you don't, you don't actually need to figure out inside the keyboard um, what the key is. You kind of just generate a table of like, here's 255 keys and then have the user type in what key did I press as a one-off calibration exercise. In practice, it looks like this. Uh, so the pads that I've soldered to are the, the, the one on the uh, left, is the first row. Everything on the right is all the columns. All that goes to a processor. Um, and then there's a voltage regulator on the left, uh, which passes power on to this thing, which is an ESP module. So this is a pretty, uh, you know, like you can get these for a dollar off AliExpress, um, but they're super, super useful. And the, so what I do is that um, I have this thing, so this is like the original keyboard. I use this microcontroller to sample the original keyboard. And then every time I've got a key, I just go, hey, yes, PO one module, go broadcast this over like a malformed packet, which like Wireshark will never pick up. Um, and yeah, so this all fits in, in a standard keyboard. And the, like, the thing is that you're now through you know, a little bit of effort, um, you are now much more likely to get away with it. Because who, like, who comes back to the desk after lunch and goes, I better unscrew all my office equipment and just, you know, just open that shit up, check for, you know, back doors, no one. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have a demo of this specific thing today, but we'll keep moving. I will release the code for this later. What is interesting from a keyboard perspective? So I did, I did some reading on how keyboards work and what are the standards that govern keyboards? Um, as, as cheesy as it may sound, I actually find reading standards kind of interesting because there's all kinds of like shit in standards. And you're like, how did this get made into regulation? This is ridiculous. And with keyboards, with keyboards, it doesn't actually scan that quickly. I think the minimum in order for you to be accepted by like the council of keyboard makers <laughs> is 26 times a second from memory. That's nothing. Your cheapest microcontroller can do that and like mine bitcoins in the spare time that you've got <laughs> using the keyboard. Don't do that. It'll be very like, anyway. Um, and in terms of budget, like this costs nothing. <laughs> don't, don't do what I say, right? And but you can, 
like all these parts are like what five five bucks, right? And you can have one of these um, for your own. All right, moving on. Uh, let's talk about mice. Uh, mice are useful because mice are one ubiquitous, right? And especially on these modern keyboards, like this fucking Mac. I'm, so like I'm not I'm not a Mac user, right? And this keyboard trips me out. Like where are the, where are the buttons? What am, what do you want me to click? Anyway, but the other thing about mice with a keyboard, when you come in to like work in the morning, right? You come in, you grab your keyboard and you plug it in. Fine. And when you leave, you unplug your keyboard and then you go home. But who's taking a mouse home? Really? No one's taking a mouse home? I'm sure some people, I have. Hey. And the thing with mice is that you, you take them with you because you don't want to use a touchpad for an hour and a half. Um, so it's super useful from that perspective. So I, again, I started off with, hey, uh, what's been done previously in this space, right? How have other people done it? And again, really interesting results is that other people have used mice to hide cameras and microphones. I was like, okay, that's cool. But hiding a microphone in a mouse seems like a really dumbass idea. Can anyone tell me what is a sound you'll pick up with a microphone in a mouse? <laughs> Fucking click, click, click. And with a camera, a camera is a great idea. Like it's, it's great because people don't suspect mice. But the thing is that you got to be there to like position the mouse correctly. What if someone uses the mouse and kind of just like shoves it to the end of the desk? You're not going to see anything until you can come and reset that. So what can we do? Well, typically in, let's say, like when you're trying to compromise someone through or something or whatever through physical means, your two easiest attacks are uh, hit, where you get them to like, you know, type in a URL, or network, where you instantiate, I'm a gigabit ethernet connection, uh, route your traffic through me, and away you go. Inside the mouse, some, if you guys have ever opened a mouse, inside a mouse is mostly empty space. And this, like, this is super cheap. Like, this looks like a mess because I'm terrible at soldering. But all it is is a, like, a $5 USB hub from Officeworks and another one of those little ESP modules. So someone, um, this dude called CN Law on GitHub, I've got the link down below, uh, he did some really interesting work where you can bit bang out USB. So he just like manually sets the ones and zeros, which I think is fantastic for USB. And has a little ES1, ESP01 perform a, uh, like it, it'll, it'll be a keyboard for you. It's really cool. You can connect to it um, and you can send USB hit commands. Um, this one is one approach. The other approach is you can go, oh, oh fuck. <laughs> The other approach is you can go all out and just like, fuck it, just hide a Raspberry Pi inside your mouse, right? <laughs> and so you have to Dremel the corners um, because, so what, what got me about this, right? I was like, hey, I'm just going to Dremel the bottom corners off because it just needs to fit in the housing. And it wasn't enough. What gets you is things like tape. So if you're making one of these, you have to be super, super careful that one, nothing moves, right? That's why I've got the hot glue. If stuff moves, you're bound to have a short circuit at some point and then you'll have the sads. But nothing can touch the scroll wheel. Otherwise, it gets, you get like weird sounds and it doesn't work and then people pick up on that. <laughs> this is what the end result looks like. And to show you what it can do, if I can reassemble this thing. Hey. Oh, okay. How do I use a Mac? Uh, hold on, bear with me. Okay. So as you can see, it functions like a normal mouse. I can SSH to it. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I don't have a Mac payload that I can demonstrate something for you. But I'll, you know what? I'll just show you. Uh, Ah. All right. Um, this uses something called GadgetFS. So if you've ever built like malicious Raspberry Pis, 
uh, you would have seen this before. What it does is creates a mini, like you can configure it by creating a mini, uh, I guess a mini file system inside a specific folder and it'll do things like, okay, I'm now a mouse. Um, so all it does is open us up this slash dev slash hit g0 and you can send, like you can open the file and write messages to it. And I've got a little alphabet converter. But all this does is it hits uh, Windows R with a modify key, eight, uh, waits for a bit for the thing to pop up and then calc.exe. Hold on, there we go. Oh. And we went, and unfortunately you won't see anything dramatic because like this is not Windows. Um, but it'll type for you. And you can reset it into becoming like a you know, network adapter. Like you can see the various payloads up the top. Um, and the, like the use case for this is this, uh, payload hid. No, that wasn't right. Go back. Okay. Um, in, in a practical situation, you use this to download like your PowerShell stage one. But here's where the beauty of it is, is that you can hide both things inside the same mouse. And then this has two advantages. One, operationally, you don't have to worry about your C2 going down because it's in the mouse. <laughs> and two, two, Imagine the look on the incident responder's face. <laughs> Malicious code from 10.1.1.2. All right. Anyway, enough of this. Onwards. Uh, does this go from, yes. And right, again, like this is not super complicated. It's not a, like this is, Next to nothing, like I'd, I'd pay this in a heartbeat for poning someone via mouse, fucking hilarious. Um, uh, one thing that you wanna watch out for is the USB hubs. USB, and I'll go into this, there's another slide on this a little bit later, but USB has many, many, very, very confusing, uh, quite honestly, uh, different standards which govern what speed it's allowed to communicate data at, how it must be initialized, whether there needs to be resistors to like help it set up correctly, and that's all great, but the higher speed, the higher the speed, the better your cable has to be. Now, I'm not an expert in this. Quite frankly, it's a miracle I haven't electrocuted myself yet. But um, you want to get old USB hubs, which is kind of good because they're like, you know, a dollar each from AliExpress. Um, the newer USB 3 hubs, I'd recommend avoiding just because one, you have more pins which you need to deal with for USB 3. And two, you need really good like signal integrity along that line. Otherwise, you, like you get effectively packet loss, except locally. Um, all right, cables. Cables is kind of the third thing. And now I'm, I've, I feel bad because I, I left the demo I had for this back at work. So I'm really sorry I won't be able to demonstrate this. Um, I think it's, it's my favorite demo out of this. The previous work in terms of backdoor cables. Now, I'm sure some of you would have seen this, uh, the mg.lol cable. It's a really cool piece of work. And what's inside the USB-A of that cable is the little ESP1 module again, but on a custom board. I actually tried to do that initially. I was like, well, shit, I mean, if he's already done the work, I can do something very similar and save myself lots of setup time. I can learn from, you know, other people's mistakes, other people's success. And... It didn't work at the time. I put it down because the ESP01 module places its components so that there's a flash chip and a CPU next to each other horizontally. And it's just too wide for the USB adapter. Everything else I can wrangle. Um, so if you want to go down that route, you absolutely can. Um, but take note that be prepared for some really fine pitched soldering and... Um, you're gonna to need to print your own boards. Won't work with the stock ones. And the other previous work was the from the NSA's Ant Catalog, which is a terrific source of inspiration. Like the NSA does some really cool stuff. And uh, Cottonmouth One was where I got this from. Cottonmouth One is, is actually, I think for its time, an absolutely incredible piece of work, right? It's 
effectively a small phone inside the end of a USB cable with a USB hub. Um, obviously, that's I, I don't think you could do that without some help doing the fabrication. Um, but anyway, I looked at it and I was like, oh, I want one of these. Let's, let's go make one. So, um, inside a USB cable, it's, it's not that complex. You have uh, two wires, the red and the black wire, devoted to powering your target or like powering the other end, whatever, the power cables. And you have two data wires, which typically are in a twisted pair configuration, but if you don't twist them together, that's kind of fine. There's lots of different standards, and there's USB made simple .co.uk. And if you visit that, it's funny because like it's meant to be USB made simple, and there's like six chapters to the book. But anyway, it's a good read if you want to learn about USB. One of the big takeaways for me was that the shape of the USB uh, plug is not related to the actual USB protocol. Um, for those of you interested in doing this more, USB-C, the, the new Mac adapters, have decoupled power delivery and data, which I think is like, it, it opens up a lot of room for experimentation in whether you can have a keyboard power a host. Anyway, besides the scope of this. Um, in practice, and really hoping to show you guys this, but no dice. Uh, there is enough room inside the inside a USB cable to just fit this thing. This thing in the middle is called a Tomu, and it's a small ARM processor, and it will emulate USB for you. You power it off the USB cable because it, it's providing power anyway. You just hook up the middle two pins to to the USB data lines, and the only problem remaining was how do you upgrade this piece of kit, right? Because once it's inside the cable, right, you can't go to someone's desk and be like, excuse me, while I you know, open the cable back up and reprogram your back door. Uh, so how, do you, how do you reprogram it and only allow you to reprogram it? The solution lies, or the solution I did, which is not very good, but works, um, was in how it did reset. So it enters a programming mode. If the two pins on the other side, so this one and this one, are uh, shorted together. So cool. I hooked them up to the data lines inside the other end of the USB cable, the micro USB, and I built an adapter, which is basically one of these things, like off the floor, and a blob of solder between the data lines. So you plug that in, plug it into your computer, enters programming mode, remove it, flash the new firmware, and your cable's good to go. Um, and the beautiful thing is that like no one checks cables. Right, you, you'd never know, like depending on the quality of manufacture, you would literally never find out that there was a backdoor in your cable. Again, like this isn't, it's like the Tomu, you can get one for 30 bucks or you can get two for 30, like it gets ridiculously cheap. They're coming out with an FPGA version, the FOMU. I feel like I'm doing a sales pitch for them, but it's, it's I think it'll be really, really good because with an FPGA, what I think, what I suspect you'll be able to do is to proxy the original USB traffic. So at the beginning, at boot, it goes, are my programming pins shorted? If they're not, act like a normal USB cable. You would never know because all your devices would just work. All right. Um, so that, like, that's, that's the stuff that has been done already. And I wanted to take a couple of minutes to share with you, uh, here's some things that I think we can do, uh, you know, mostly because I think it's funny. Um, peppermint, which again, I was hoping to show you, uh, but no dice. Um, when we talk about exfiltration of data from a network, everyone I talk to goes, oh yeah, I'm going to exfiltrate it to my C2 in AWS. I'm going to send it to a server in, you know, Azure, which is great, but I think like, that's a really restrictive approach. Why don't you exfiltrate over Bluetooth? Why don't you exfiltrate over sound? Why don't you exfiltrate over, like, failure codes from your fingerprint scanner? Right? You, and it turns out that you kind of can. There's absolutely no restriction to it. And the model of C2, which I think, 
like is, is kind of silly now, right? Because right now, imagine if you're trying to exfiltrate data from a network, your C2 has to remain up. If your C2 loses power, you're no longer collecting data, which is rather silly. Like it's 2019 and the solution is not UPS, right? <laughs> and I think a better way that we can do this as an industry is to use looter nodes, where you walk into a building, activate your looter node, and it pings out to every compromised device in your physical vicinity. And it goes, I am here, report on your capabilities. How much data do you have? What are you sniffing? What's your uptime? And have that exfiltrate all over like malformed packets, radio, Bluetooth, IR, like what? You can't defend against it because it's a needle in a haystack problem. How do you solve it if you don't know what you're looking for? Anyway. The other thing, so from the NSA Ant catalog, there was a project called God Surge. This was, um, I think it was really ahead of its time, it was very revolutionary, which they added a chip into, I think it was Dell servers. And what it would do is it would ping home. And, or like it would, it would I think it would enable debug functionality via JTAG. Because it was hardwired into the server, like it was, it was you know, a supply chain attack. And they inserted this extra hardware and it would enable uh, JTAG at least but I assume insert additional vulnerabilities or call home using the original device. Now, um, if you all have a look at the NSA and catalog, what you'll see is this massive board, which looks like in, in, by today's standards, that's like a home soldering job. But, you know, technology was different then. But now, times have changed. This technology is available to each and every one of us. Again, um, it's a shame I can't oh, do a full demo of this, but the device that you see in the picture is one of these. And this is bigger than that. Like this has an additional ethernet socket and like USB because I need it for other stuff. But it's like, imagine just the bottom layer of this little cube is one of these devices. And it has more than enough programming power more than enough CPU power to, to um, do the same thing that the original God Surge implant did and more. Hell, it's got USB. Give it 4G backhaul and then have it call out to you. And then when you give it commands, just do like remote open OCD, like remote JTAG to someone's device that they can never turn off. How are they going to find it? You can hide this in like someone's phone. And what, like, are you going to disassemble your phone every day? No, you're not. <laughs> um, anyway. Cool. That's uh, all I had. I don't know how we've gone for time, but um, questions, heckling, thoughts. Yes. So what's the? Oh, so so do you mean what is the build time for me to make one of these devices? Okay. Couple hours. Um, so okay. Sorry, I'll qualify that. The keyboard initially took me about two weeks of figuring out what was wrong. I sat at home staring at an oscilloscope going, what the fuck? Um, but once you know like the concept behind it, it's a couple hours. Yeah. Just, yes? With the keyboard, I mean, you know, you know they keep it piece by piece and you do that. Yes. Um, my question is, how can you... I'm assuming there's probably no way to defend against this. Okay. Or, or is there? Interesting question. So uh, for the benefit of everyone who's watching, um, the question was effectively, is there a way to defend against it? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I thought about this. And initially I reached the same conclusion as you. I was like, there's no way that you can defend against it. But one thing spikes dramatically when you do this, when you exfiltrate data, is power use. You can detect that something is, you. sometimes you can detect it and go, you're going over the allocated power that you should take for a USB 1.1 device with no negotiation. The countermeasure to that is just being aware of how much power you can have. Like for a USB 1.1 device or for US, whatever, one of the USB devices, uh, you're allowed, I think, 500 milliamps of power. So you test it while you're making it. You go, I'm taking 200 milliamps which is fine because it won't break anything. 
and it won't set off any alarms. And as long as no one rips out the keyboard and plugs it into a power meter to check, which no one would do, you're fine. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Excellent. I feel like we went in a little circle. You asked how to defend against it, and I was like, mm, no, here's how you break that. Anyway, um, cool. Anyone else? No? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Have you actually implemented it? Uh, do you want, I mean, so have I actually implemented it? So the mouse is here. Uh, the keyboard is at work and the cable. So the funny story about the cable, right? Because when I was leaving for, for here, I was like, oh, I'll just bring my cable and demo and I can't find it. So if you find any cables on the road, don't plug it in. Um, yeah, it, this is all the stuff. So these last two are not completely done. All the rest is done. Yep. Uh, yes? What's your like, takeaway if I not get owned by this? Uh, what's your, okay, so what's your takeaway? Don't let you fiddle with my keyboard? Or? So how not to get owned by this? And again, I think this ties into the previous question. It's really interesting because I think how not to get owned by this actually requires more thinking as an industry. I think we need to work out effectively a side channel to the side channel, which bypasses the problem of like, because right now it's power consumption, but you, you can't power meter every peripheral, you know, every time you leave. Um, So, so completely, completely surveil all your devices until you realize that your security camera is also pwned. Whoa. Anyway. <laughs> I like it. Uh, yes? Maybe there's a way, um, like in terms, there might be some way to fingerprint the EMF of each yes. device somehow, just to, the, uh, yeah. the radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation emitted by a device in typical usage, and then compare that to yeah, other, other devices that you think might be I like it. compromised. Um, so, the, so the idea was, uh, can, can we measure the electromagnetic emissions of a device that has been compromised and use that to somehow determine it's been compromised? I love it. Like that's, I think it's a really cool idea. I don't know how you do it, but like maybe we can do some kind of baselining against like this is what a normal keyboard looks like because they kind of work all the same. Right, and this is what a popped one looks like. Look, it generates these spikes at odd intervals. Honestly, that would work against this. Um, you probably, we're not at the point where we can give every desk an oscilloscope and like a coil, but um, like that, that would absolutely work. You'd, you'd be like, hold on, this is transmitting massive amounts of data somewhere. Something's wrong, it's a keyboard, it shouldn't be. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really, really good. Yes? What's the time to detect when once you put the implant in? What's the time to detect? Um, okay, so look, I, I, don't, I don't have a single answer, but I think this is like it's, there's room for discussion on this, right? So I guess uh, how, how would you guys try to do the detection? So we've had EMF, which I think is a good idea. You might look at my C2. So you'd look at where I'm sending the data. You'd look at patterns, right? So say, for example, I was a, a staff member at an organization and I was walking around in places which I shouldn't be every day. That might be a problem. Maybe security camera footage. So some things you might have to swap the batteries out on. Um, you know, all of that. Or like, I, I don't know. I don't know how, how you detect it. From a, but from a typical organization standpoint, I'm kind of thinking you just wouldn't detect it because no one's checking. There is no IP address or the IP address starts with 10. So like how, how are you going to detect it? Your logs show nothing because they're not designed to log this and they never will. Like you, you can't make, you know, incident response based on like fluctuations in, you know, the, the magnetic profile of an area like otherwise what would IR be doing just running around all day you know chasing solar flares and whatnot <laughs> um, but you know it, like it's a good question I think there's a lot of room for thought and I'm sorry I don't have an answer uh, yes so a lot of the um, the first vector is that you'll need physical access to the target yep um, 
assuming that there is relatively decent security control, say, in a data center of a um, Google Facebook, how do you then get that uh, in that implant in there in the first place? And then by returning it to Officeworks. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, no, no. So, okay. Good, good question. Good question. In all seriousness, right? How do you get something into a building? Right? Like how, and not only do you need to get something into the building, you need to get them to, to plug it in as well. And as you say, you need to get it out of the building. Though I think out is a secondary concern. Let's get it in first. Um, who would refuse like a gift? Oh no, but I, I just feel okay. I, I can I can just mail it to people. I can no, but I can not not from me, not from me. But I can just like mail these things to people. I can hand out like free, you know, free stuff at like you know win a promotion when you enter this thing. And the thing is that the people who like put the real details down for these promotions are probably going to be the people who plug in your keyboard. Not like not a dig at them, but like realistically, right? It's it's a human trust problem, I think. To to answer your original point, I think what you're talking about is outside the realm of technology and more of a how you exploit the interpersonal relationships to get someone to plug something in, which is slightly different to a USB drop attack. The mouse I'll I'll make an exception for and the cables, because everyone just uses them. Right, especially in shared office environments. People just come in and plug in a mouse. Like, this is a corporate mouse. In we go. This is a cable someone's left lying around. I need to charge my phone. In we go. So, like, I, again, I don't really have an answer, but I think it's, it's food for thought. It's a really good question. Um, yes? Do you see any uh, uh, emerging trends in terms of the hardware supply chain attacks? You know, things with, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Huawei products recently have gotten a lot of attention. So do you, do, you, do you see any emerging trends in this, in this space? Okay, so do I see any emerging trends in this space with regards to, and, and help me understand your question, are you talking about like existing attacks in this space or just the industry as a whole? Industry as a whole. Industry as a whole, okay. Um, to be honest, I think the really frightening answer is no. And that's frightening because there should be trends about it. Like we, we should consider this. Instead of going, nah, it's impossible, like no one can ever do this and then, you know, go buy 10 keyboards from Kmart. Um, <laughs> at, at a, like, but you see media scares. And here, here's the tricky thing about, I think, human psychology. You guys remember there was an article not too long ago talking about how, like, um, super microchips got compromised somewhere, something like, I don't remember the details. But the broad response to that was, oh, shit, we can't do anything. And if you start from that mindset, you've lost already because it doesn't matter what the technical countermeasures are. You've already accepted that you can't fix it. So, yeah, I mean, in, to, to answer your question more directly is that I don't see any trends and that really scares me. Cool. Yes. Um, what about logging on the endpoint? Did you have a look at any of the logging that comes through like Windows logging to see okay. if you can spoof the vendor IDs and things like that to go undetected? Um, excellent question. So I guess more broadly, you're asking about how do I deal with logging? Um, and do I do things like, you know, forge vendor IDs, product IDs? So is it possible to do that specifically? Absolutely. Um, th so the keyboard, first of all, never touches the USB. The computer never realizes anything wrong. There's no logs. Um, with anything else that goes and emulates a uh, device, I'm counting on the fact that you, one, can't block USB hubs because people want to use USB hubs. Right? People go, I need a cable extender for this thing. I'm just going to plug it into a hub. And um, I'm counting on the fact that generic devices are not blocked. All the stuff that you've seen all emulates like generic keyboard. Ah, except for this mouse. What I found with the mouse, because the mouse pretends to be a keyboard starter. But the problem is when you plug that into Windows, it goes, 
installing driver for mouse, installing driver for generic USB hub, which goes away in a sec because like most people already have it, installing driver for keyboard. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> but that's okay because as part of the USB spec, you can just rename your device to generic optical mouse. <laughs> and so there's two optical mice but how many of you have opened Device Manager and been like, oh, I have fucking six mice in this computer? <laughs> right? So, sorry, to answer your question, have I thought about it? Somewhat. Does it work? Again, somewhat. I think it's a race between whether my keyboard, mouse, keyboard thingy fools someone looking at the log. And is that person on the ball enough to go, that's the wrong vendor ID? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Oh, God, so many. All right. Uh, if, yes? Um, you mentioned earlier that um, sometimes you'll get the alert from that same Windows where it's, yes. it's going too much power. Um, just from a detection perspective, I guess, um, it's possible that there's maybe some way to, to track that. Is there any logic or registry notifications or anything Ooh. like that? Okay, so uh, on a Windows system, and are you asking about just Windows or more broadly? Well, Windows is probably a good example because I recall that it's going to power on it. Okay. Um, so on a Windows box, is it possible to somehow detect this kind of attack by the fact that it's drawing too much power? Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, maybe. I think what shows up in Windows logs, and you know, I'm, I'm guessing here, is that the device is malfunctioning. Because Windows thinks you've got a short circuit, and it will disable the device to prevent damage to its internal USB hubs. Um, I, but, I mean, what do you do when someone actually plugs in a mouse that's malfunctioning? It's not the fault that the mouse had, you know, damage or was poorly manufactured. And what's more likely? From a defense standpoint, is it more likely that someone's plugged in an old mouse because what a company's good at saving money? <laughs> and <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that for being recorded, but anyway, uh, <laughs> it's too late. Uh, is it more likely that someone will plug in an old mouse which is just simply worn down and has physical damage or someone's a victim of one of this? And the other thing, USB is very generous with the power that it um, hands out. As long as you're not actively transmitting all the time, I don't see you running into that problem. And even if you were, like a, a mouse, you could probably hide two Raspberry Pis in there before anyone noticed. <laughs> but because they take 200 milliamps of power and you're allowed 500. Just stack more stuff in there. Stack a GPS module in there. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so but it's, it's an interesting line of thought. I like it, and I think with some with some support from like OS vendors, you could do that. You could detect this. Um, yeah, cool. Ah, yes. Have you used this in a rate team? And any war <laughs> stories from that? How does it perform? Uh, <laughs> I'm I am not here on behalf of my employer, um, but. In terms of general performance, I actually think this is only worthwhile when you are very sure of the flow of events. The problem with these attacks is that if someone picks up a backdoor cable and plugs it into a Mac, you're instantly detected, right? Be like, because your cable just typed in 30 paragraphs of PowerShell. But <laughs> what, what is more interesting is these things. They literally fit inside a packet of gum. And so this thing has, I mean, onboard Wi-Fi. So this was, it, it wasn't, into, it, originally I had it fitting all inside the pack of gum, but last night I had to add USB and Ethernet. Anyway, um, this thing you can walk into anywhere with this. It has an on button. It has a start harvesting people's WPA2 hashes button and an off button and room for extensibility at the back. Which means that when I'm somewhere and I go, hey, wait, hold on. I need to attack an ethernet interface. No problem, it's here. Hold on, I'm missing a package. No worries, shove a 4G stick in. 
it like you know you have to do some trickery with USB mode switch to get it to work, but it works. I'm a big believer in building devices which are attack platforms and are flexible because I think that's what counts. You don't want to have something that can do one attack and then like if you plug it in like to the wrong USB port, nah, it's over. Um, so I I know that's not what you originally asked in terms of effectiveness, but I hope that sheds some light on how I try to approach getting effective attacks. Does that help? Kinda? Yes. Winning. Kinda. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. It's a question from uh, Ryan on YouTube. Right. Oh. <laughs> Would the best way to protect against this type of attack be the vendors limiting the amount of power, mice, or keyboards draw? No. Um, because you can just stick a battery pack inside. Actually, uh, speaking of battery packs, so this device, the reason why the rest of this crap can't fit inside the pack of gum is because there's a battery pack inside. This will run for about a day with no extra support. The little power module supports like charge while in use. So you just like swap in and out battery packs. So if you really wanted to hide, you just like bring your own power supply and not power it off USB. The heavy. Are the batteries heavy? <laughs> no, I mean, so this is just like a phone battery. So not really. And besides, like, would you notice if your mouse weighed 100 grams heavier? Yeah. Yeah. Would. <laughs> so I think, okay, okay. I think it's an interesting thought. And I think actually, realistically, the answer is no. One, because the other day I, ac I like, accidentally left this on someone's desk and I came back and I was like, I don't think you should use that mouse. <laughs> but, but how do you use a mouse? Think about like your hand when you use a mouse. You move it sideways. No one lifts so bad. Like there's no function to fucking lift the mouse like middle click, right? So could you detect it? Yes, if you lifted the mouse. But are you going to lift the mouse and are you going to notice a one-off thing? You might just be like, no, it's probably just I haven't had coffee yet. And then go have and forget. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thought. It's an absolutely interesting thought. The other, um, the other way that you could approach this problem is by doing a half and half solution where you sometimes drew power from the host, but sometimes powered it off battery. Perhaps it's like, you know, like a, a, a UPS backup kind of solution. You go, when I'm unpowered, but in the middle of running a payload, you use the battery. I don't know how you do it. I don't know if it's even possible, but I think it's, it's food for thought. Um, so yeah, uh, good question though. Cool. All good. Ah. Uh, yes, one time. Um, is there is there any like notice, noticeable input lag? Like say for example, you have the Raspberry Pi in the mouse. Like, does that slow the mouse down at all? Nope. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, no. And the reason why it doesn't is because it's just using the actual mouse and a USB hub. It's no different as if you plug it into a USB hub because that's literally what it is. Um, How many of your creations would you estimate are lying around in the wild somewhere because you left them? No, no, no. Um, so. There's one cable which I'm sure is in the wild because I can't find it. No, no, but like these things, I think uh, like being responsible, when I say things like return them to office works, I'm joking. Um, don't, don't do that. Don't, I, I'm not here to that one. But, so um, I, I do think like with these things, it's cool to build, but we should like take care of them. And just because I don't, I don't want to lose them, right? I put effort into this. I don't. It's like losing a puppy. I don't want to, you know. I don't want to just leave it out there. Uh, uh, I'm thinking one way you could prevent, um, like the mouse talking to the computer, is if the manufacturer has some sort of encryption on the actual chip itself. Ah. Oh. The computer. So then you couldn't really do anything about that. So, uh, encryption on the chip between the computer and the mouse, right? Yes. This is really interesting. Have you? Who uses Razer products here? Okay, good, 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 good. Razer has really interesting philosophy with their drivers, which may I remind you are some of the most privileged bits of code in your system. And they're like, let me send your things to the cloud. And like what I think is uh, interesting is that it's a trade-off in security. Because when you do that, you're opening yourself up to other attacks against the drivers. And drivers, in my mind, a driver should be like, I am a lookup table for interpreting a mouse movement into a cursor movement. That's it. No cloud, 
no backups, like nothing. But many modern manufacturers disagree with me. That's fine. Um, but I, I think like it's not a perfect solution. And you, you might not need to. Like there's other things that you can do, right? Let's pretend we had encryption between each and every component. First of all, I'm plugging in legitimate components to legitimate components via USB hub. Encryption's fine. Second, with communication, like I think this is where we need to think outside the box. And this is the whole point of this talk, right? Sure, I can't communicate to like the network via an implant in your mouse, but I don't need to. Like I can plug in some other implant somewhere else, have the mouse talk to that and do like NTLM relay. Like, but, like we, we don't need to directly, I, like I think we gotta, we gotta push the boundaries of how we think about it and look for like ideas which seem stupid at first, but allow us to do really cool attacks. Yeah, I, I think it'd be fun. And, you know, like if you guys are interested, um, I'd actually be super keen on working with you guys to make more of these things. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun for me. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, hit me up and we'll do cool stuff. Cool. <laughs> uh, hit me up after. Oh, uh, so I guess if you do encryption with some of the wireless keyboards, yep. uh, I think you can tap it before the encryption as yep. well, but does it make it harder for you to, to put something inside? No. Okay. No, it doesn't. But good question though. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to check these cables before? No, 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 no. These, are good. these are mine. I'll take them with me. <laughs> I guess now we find out why we having Norman to, to come every so often to, to Sec Talks to give a talk. And we, like always, we do look, look for a speakers. You know, it can be a short talk, it can be a workshop, it can be a cool project that you worked on, things that you can share with the community and everyone here. Please come forward talk with any of the organizers you can find here. So we can line up your talk. And uh, for the people who were online, unfortunately, sorry, it was first time we run this. We do love to hear your, your comments, your feedback, that how we can improve this and how we can manage it better. Please let us know. And uh, there is still food and drink on the back. Please help yourself. After this, we are slowly packing up to go to the untied, the cup one block, I think, towards the south. And uh, Ninja Night happening next week. Details are on Meetup page. And pretty much that's it. Hope to see you guys at our June Meetup. <laughs>